This week, let's take a look at exactly what culture is. The term culture has many meanings. In popular usage, it is often equated with distinctive traditions of different ethnic groups. Examples include Mexican mariachi music, Chinese food, or British theater. These are certainly representative of cultures, but they are only the tip of the iceberg. Culture is also popularly used to denote so-called refined sensibilities. That is to say, one can be called cultured for enjoying classical music in the theater, in contrast to pop music in Hollywood blockbusters. Anthropologists use the term in a different manner. For anthropologists, culture is a very broad concept. Specifically, it does not involve value judgments. For example, someone being more cultured or less. Culture was first defined by anthropologist E.B. Taylor in 1871. That complex and whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. As you can see, the definition was very broad. Since Taylor's day, literally hundreds of definitions for culture have been forwarded. Let's take a look at your book's definition. Culture is a system of knowledge, beliefs, patterns, or behavior, artifacts, and institutions that are created, learned, and shared by a group of people. Can you think of one thing that has changed in our culture since you were born? How about the fact that it is now considered proper to refer to the male carrier as a male person as opposed to a male man? Let's break down the cultural concept and look at individual pieces. Central to the modern anthropological view of culture is that it is learned. A person must be enculturated. You must learn the culture you live in. This is contrary to older notions, often racially motivated notions, that one is born into a culture. If culture is learned, then it must also be taught. This is done in many ways. But often a child's first teachers are its parents. We raise our children to emulate what we think is normal. We teach them how to talk to adults and how to interact with their peers. In short, we teach them when it's appropriate to kiss. There are many other cultural teachers in our society. Simply taking part in social activities with other people is perhaps the most basic form of cultural education. Children quickly learn what is and is not acceptable in a group interaction. Stealing toys, for example, quickly results in group sanctions and other children don't want to play with you. Schools often form a core function of cultural education. Not only do students learn math, history, and science, they also learn about birthday parties, national holidays, and traditional forms of celebration. As culture continues to change, Cultural learning and teaching become a lifelong activity. Think, for example, of emergent internet technologies. Not only does the technology and programming have to be developed, but new social norms of interaction have to be developed. Just as there are cultural patterns of interaction in the real world, there are similar patterns in the digital world. Do you like a friend's Facebook status if it says something bad? Culture is inherently a group concept. It is a shared experience that derives from living as a member of a group. If only one person is involved, we're, we are just talking about personality. Hence, culture is by definition shared. At the same time, you know that nothing in a culture is permanent. For example, American culture has recently been debating the topic of homosexual marriage. While there is substantial legal discussion, there is also cultural question. Is homosexual marriage okay? Regardless of specific legal standing. In recent years, public opinion and legal opinion have made substantial movement toward a collective concept that homosexual marriage is permissible. This was not even remotely true 20 or even 10 years previously. The central idea here is that culture is contested. We have a shared culture that we learn from our fellow group members. Once learned, that culture is not static. When there are parts of it that people do not like, those parts can be changed. 
The act of changing a culture, however, is difficult and can be seen usually over long periods of time. There are four main concepts that illustrate the symbolic and material aspects of culture. They are norms, values, symbols, and mental maps. We'll take a look at each of these. Norms refer to concepts of normal behavior. These are ideas or rules about how people should behave in different situations. For example, when is it okay to kiss? Norms are constructed through regular practice. That is to say, they are created by the most common actions of people within a group. Marriage norms can be a good example. In some cultures, marrying within a group is common. In other, marrying outside of a group is instead the norm. Take the classic Romeo and Juliet story. Romeo and Juliet wish to have an exogamous marriage. They wish to marry members of two different groups, families, who are feuding. This act of social rebellion against cultural norms forms the plot for Shakespeare's play. Looking at U.S. history, there has been a cultural norm for marrying within one's racial group. Some states even criminalize interracial marriages to enforce this norm. The strength of this cultural prejudice arose out of decades of racial segregation in the United States. Only finally in 1967 did the U.S. Supreme Court rule that this prejudicial law was unconstitutional in the case of Loving v. Virginia. Most people within a culture follow its norms, but cultural change often arises from resistance to such norms. Hence, the United States has seen a long-term movement towards accepting interracial exogamous marriages. Cultural norms and values are often expressed through symbols, particularly when we consider that even language is a symbol. Language is a common human tool for symbolic abstraction. Essentially, as you know, language allows us to communicate our ideas. However, language is an abstraction where sound stands in place for a concept or an idea. For example, consider the word tree. If tree was a fixed symbol rather than abstract, everyone around the world would use the same word. Instead, there are an infinite variety of words out there that also signify tree. Language is the ultimate tool for symbolic communication of cultural norms and values. In fact, it's how I can even talk to you about cultural norms and values. Language, however, is just the tip of the iceberg for cultural use of symbols. Human culture has a remarkable ability to distill complex institutions into single syllables. Christianity and all that it entails can be expressed by a crucifix or even just a cross. Entire nations, their histories and cultures can be expressed by a flag. As an example of the importance of symbols, one need look no further than the lengthy debates the U.S. Congress has held in regards to how flag desecrations should be treated, or one may consider Germany where swastikas have been outlawed. Humans have an unrivaled ability to distill meanings into symbols. The human ability to use symbols ties directly to our use of mental maps. Mental maps represent a person's attempt to distill the complex world around them into understandable categories. The world around us is incredibly complex. You cannot look at every blade of grass, or even cloud, or even at every person that walks by. Our brains are hardwired towards classification. We lump things into categories, thus making it easier to navigate this world. Our own personal mental maps are heavily influenced by cultural constructs. Norms and values influence what we think is important, and symbols suggest how we encode information. As products of our own culture, we cannot escape it. It influences the way we think and the way we act. To emphasize the cultural nature of mental maps of the world, we can look at concepts of time. We tend to think of time as an absolute, something that is objectively real, rather than culturally constructed. And yet, the clocks that we live our lives by create arbitrary structures. The length of a day is a natural unit, from sunrise to sunset, a unit that does not change. But the structure of 24 hours, 60 minutes to an hour, 60 seconds to a minute, is entirely arbitrary. 
there is no reason we could not divide the day into 20 units or 30. Time units are inherited cultural tradition. The same goes for our calendar. The Gregorian calendar is a relatively recent construct in the world, only 500 years old. Many other calendars have and will be used in the future. Our mental maps help us encode and understand information. We don't have to think about the fact that the length of a year is actually 365.2425 days rather than from January 1st to December 31st.